It's February, my favourite time at the gym. The equipment is not always taken, the classes are emptier, there's less waiting around for weights. What is crowded, however, is that 6pm line in reception to cancel memberships. And it's not just my gym. Strava, a network that collects physical data from 800 million users, found that on average, every year, about 80% of people will quit their New Year's resolutions to exercise by the second Friday of January, dubbed the Quitter's Day. A fourth of people will not even make it into the second week. Despite being on my high horse for sweating in February, I've only been a regular gym goer for 10 months. But what I am an absolute expert in is quitting the gym. For exactly 10 years before that, I have quit 12 gym establishments for more reasons than I can count. Because I hated it, because I didn't have the time, because I had exams, because I had the flu, took a week off and never went back, because progress is hard to maintain and because I have to force myself to do enough things that at some point gym just has got to give. Before this last year, I've had less of quitter's days and more of a quitter's decade. And clearly, I'm not the only one who struggles with this. In their 2012 paper, Ekakakis and Afromos describe the physical activity paradox as the most frustrating phenomena in public health. On the one hand, as Jeremy Morris put it in 1994, physical activity is the best buy in public health. On the other hand, Dishman in 2001 described promoting physical activity as a very tough sell. So we're not buying it, but, but how, how tough is this sell? Well, you know, Let's just say, if you are struggling with hitting your fitness goals at the gym, you are absolutely not alone. What studies show that 97% of people would agree that physical inactivity is a risk factor for health. They also show that in 2008, only 3.5% of adults hit their recommended physical activity levels every week. Another study found that on 91.1% of all days, participants accumulated less than one minute of vigorous physical activity a day. How do these numbers make any sense? And I say this being able to vouch for this kind of thinking myself. I'm going to be a doctor in a few months and I very well know the importance of physical exercise, yet I was completely unable to do it regularly. This physical activity paradox has bothered psychologists and economists for a while, challenging the core of our contemporary theories of behaviour. A paper describes that when presented with a behavioural option that can credibly lower the risk of an important negative outcome, e.g. death, most people thinking and acting rationally will take that option. The problem is we don't. But why? What I'm going to do today is explain the main findings that come up again and again and again in the tens of papers that I've read about exercise, motivation, behaviour, psychology and health that show that if your brain works like mine and apparently most other people's, it actually is the rational choice not to go to the gym, even though we think that we want to. I'll explain how our exercise-specific behavioural changes, goal setting, concepts of enjoyment and motivation can be setting us up for failure. I know this can be quite intense, so I've tried to summarise everything as well as possible and I'll go through this in detail, but I'll be using the trend theoretical model, the self-determination theory, outcome proximity, theory of second best and satisfying to explain everything. If you're the kind of person who likes to break things down to understand them and at the moment doesn't really enjoy going to the gym, hopefully when you are done with this, like me, you'll find it a lot harder to not go to the gym and find it a lot more enjoyable and easier to do it. A pen and paper might be useful if you want to do some exercises and thinking of your own, but otherwise let's get into my favourite nerdy things, the human brain. Let's get started. Before we start, I want to thank the sponsor of this video and their prompt for me to go on this medical report reading rampage, Copilot. While most of what I'm talking about today has to do with ourselves and our own brains, the best way to reach our fitness goals is to be guided by someone who knows what they're doing. Having another human being who is a fitness expert, gets to know you, talk to you, understand you, create and adjust personalized fitness programs is absolutely life-changing. Everyone who watches this video can get two free weeks with a fitness coach and access to everything on the app. This means, like me, you can jump on a call with your fitness coach and share with them your thoughts, worries, desires and anxieties and they can come up with a personalized fitness plan for you to follow. I like going to the gym for my exercise so therefore based on the equipment I have available and like to use and my goals, my coach Cara will create and keep me accountable for my exercises. We have an agreement where she can harass me if I skip the gym because I am sat 
doing work and I forget what time it is and then the gym closes and this sort of arrangement works out really great for me. I'm not sure how it works out for her, but you can let your coach know what your preferred style of accountability and communication frequency and style is. Once I'm at the gym, I just can press start and follow every single exercise which is already timed and shown how to do on my screen, which for a complete amateur who's also an introvert, it is an absolute dream not to have to engage with anyone or ask any sorts of questions and just put my headphones on and do my thing. Because I link my app to my Apple Watch, Kara gets to also see my movements for all that's worth and she always therefore knows how my form is if I am giving up on an exercise too quickly or not going too deeply into a movement or not giving everything my best effort, which can be pressure, but it's really great for my progress and performance. All types of tracking and numbers are automatically done on the app because I don't think I would be doing this, but it also means that I know that I've had a streak of over 50 workouts in a row. Now, if you knew me in real life, you would know how impressive this is. I do not enjoy moving. I cannot even ride a bike. This is crazy. Kara, my coach, is an absolute angel and our relationship works really, really well. But if for some reason you're not getting along with your coach, you can always switch super easily right within the app. By talking and getting to know an expert, lots of opportunities for me to quit are just missed because the solutions are found automatically. And I already feel that I'm a completely different person than 10 months ago when I started using Copilot. Since you already mentioned stats in this video, it'll be very easy to appreciate the fact that 75% of Copilot users are still exercising at 100 days, which makes them nine times more likely to stick to their goals. So for this and everything else, it's no wonder that it was named by Forbes as one of the best personal training apps in 2022. If you do want those free two weeks of personal training and access to everything on the app, which I would recommend to everyone who clicked on this video, there'll be a link in the description, or you can use the QR code on the screen to get access to it. Now let's get into the psychology of gym. The first thing I discovered is that if we misunderstand how behaviors are formed, then quitting the gym can become the rational choice. Let me explain. For most of us, myself first, we tend to think of behavior as binary. So we're either doing it or we are not. We're either working out or we have stopped or quit. And so we focus all of our efforts to go from the inactivity to activity. But unlike gym subscriptions, behavior is not a binary. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. Turns out there's a lot of different stages of activity and there's a lot of different stages of quitting. And by understanding where you are exactly, you can help yourself to get to where you need to be. And by not noticing those nuances, your efforts might be futile or set up for failure. It's kind of like the concept of what got you here won't get you there. 1997, these two guys, Prochaska and Clementi developed the transtheoretical model of behavioral change, which describes exactly that. And there's more than two steps. The first stage is pre-contemplation, where we have no intention of behavior modification. This is thinking exercise is cool or exercise sucks, or you know, that person is, is fit, I guess, but you're not really involving yourself in this activity. Number two is contemplation, where there is interest, but no intention of present behavior modification. This is seeing a documentary that reminds us that, oh yeah, maybe I do need to move more or feeling less physically fit when we have to run for a late train, but there's no plan yet. Number three is preparation, where there's a high intention of behavior modification and you are getting ready to start the change shortly. This involves registering to the gym, finding your gym outfits, maybe doing some research online, thinking about what your plan will be, seeing if there's friends of yours that go to the gym if you like to do that. Number four is behavior. This is the moment that you go to the gym for the first time and you take action until six months after starting. It is defined by having a high risk of relapse into the previous behavior, aka quitting the gym or not exercising. Number five is maintenance. This starts six months after you begin the activity until you eventually stop it or the end of your life. Here, the behavior is considered fixed. Now, why is this important? You may have noticed that the first three of these behaviors kind of fall into the quitting or inactivity group. And the other two, behavior maintenance, fall into the action taking or going to the gym group. However, if we lose this distinction and nuance and just group them all together, those of us who do not enjoy going to the gym subconsciously might be thinking the following. We are not working out. We are feeling physically more rested. We might have some enjoyment because we're doing other activities that we enjoy more in that time 
time and we have a high amount of mental and emotional guilt because we're not exercising. And when we're exercising and not very good at it, we are feeling a lot of physical exhaustion. We're feeling emotional exhaustion from having to force ourselves to do something that we don't enjoy, frustration for not enjoying it, and also potentially even a feeling of guilt for not being good enough. And so whenever I am in the state of exercising, I feel so drained physically and emotionally and mentally, I know I cannot force myself to keep doing this forever and I know I'm just never going to enjoy it. And so actually quitting on balance becomes the lesser of two evils and therefore a rational choice. And what happens is I fall back onto quitting. Then I'm comfortable in my physical and mental relief of quitting until I've quit for so long that my guilt accumulates, accumulates and accumulates and it suddenly becomes the rational choice and less painful to start exercising again. And the cycle begins. And I managed to stay in the cycle for a decade. I refer to the first three stages a bit later, but when we talk about action, by distinguishing between behavior and maintenance, we can immediately shift our expectations and thoughts around how painful doing this activity is. By understanding that by taking action, I am going to be in either behavior, which is doing hard things one day at a time, or in maintenance, which is finding one day at a time easier. With this break and distinction, I actually have a concrete thing to look forward to because I know that by definition, even if it doesn't feel better, it will feel easier in six months. And so I don't need to think that I have to force myself to do this forever, which is extremely helpful. When it feels extremely hard, I know I'm still in behavior. And when it starts to get easier, which I'm expecting, I know that I'm going to switch onto maintenance. And this has been proven in their original paper back in the day for exercise specifically, because it shows as we move along the stages of behavioral change, going towards behavior and later maintenance, the negative feelings and effects of behavior become less and less, and the positive effects and feelings of behavior become higher and higher. So rationally, I can pinpoint where I am along the stage of behavioral change based on how I'm feeling about exercise at that time. And I'll talk about how to move ourselves from one stage to the next later. Even knowing that there's a high risk of relapse that might be permanent with maintenance, that is going to be the same across both sides, all sides. And therefore we can change our subconscious assumptions about how bad exercise is and wanting to quit the gym and rather convert it into a conscious nuance of realizing we just need to take this one day at a time and it will get better. This is a very common theory in AA and William Griffith Wilson, who wrote the book in 1938, actually refers to taking things one day at a time, 15 times in his book. Relapse or quitting on your goals becomes very common because of the fear of how difficult things will be forever. And therefore by focusing on one day at a time and ignoring how difficult things would be when his girlfriend breaks up with him or when his friend dies or when he's at a wedding or a funeral and actually just focusing on making it through the day, or in my case, I try to think of it as making it through the week or what kind of exercise can I do right now, this week, and kind of ignoring the long-term facts and fears of not being good at exercise and not ever enjoying it really helps with getting through the day. These are great things to work through with any coach that you have, thinking of what might be some rational reasons that you have quit in the past and that make it more likely for you to think that it doesn't make sense for you to keep exercising. Thinking with your coach, what can you do to exercise today or this week? And building with them a plan that kind of helps you as much as possible, make it to that six month-ish mark where maybe you can experience what it's like for this to feel a bit easier. If like me, one of the main reasons that you keep quitting the gym is that you don't enjoy it, We've been scammed. Studies show that it isn't how we feel when we exercise, but the reasons that we tell ourselves that we need to exercise in the first place that determine how much we enjoy working out. Let me explain this because it blew my mind. If I ask you for a moment to step into what you imagine to be the body of someone who enjoys to exercise and tell me what you think they might be feeling in regards to this. If you're like me, you might be thinking that, well, I mean, I guess they get a feeling of endorphins and enjoy it, whatever those feel like. And I guess that they just like naturally like to move and they probably enjoy feeling strong and maybe they're a bit of a masochist, I don't know. Well, I think I have enough misery in my life already and I don't enjoy this. So as soon as my life becomes too depressing and difficult, it just has to go. Psychology, however, would disagree with me because it suggests that it is not what we experience physically when we exercise that determines if we enjoy it, but it's in our head 
which is great because we can change that stuff. It turns out the people who quit the gym and the people who don't quit the gym actually have no significant difference in how much they report to enjoy exercise, at least in the classical sense, which is a bit crazy, right? Because how are those people who are working out then forcing themselves to do it all the time? Are they just lying to themselves that they enjoy it? What is going on? So let's look further into the brains of people who reportedly enjoy exercise. To understand this, Russell, in a paper in 2003, described the feelings of good and bad as being a response that emanates from various different levels. At the most basic level, we have the core affect, a automatic, cognitively unmediated feeling of pleasure or displeasure. In relation to exercise pleasure, this brings us all on one level. It is the great equalizer. If we're physically able to, we will all find it pleasurable to be swimming on a beautiful, warm summer day. And equally, we will all feel like we're dying if we have to run in hot and humid conditions. We can't change these and they all feel the same for everyone. But on the other end of the spectrum, Russell describes pleasant and unpleasant emotional states, highly complex, intrinsically culture-bound, cognitively mediated, and crucially, cognitively modifiable. This is where there's a clear distinction between those who hate exercise and quit it, and those who enjoy it and tend to do it more. So, what are these thoughts? Now, 2014 paper in Applied Psychology, Evans and Cook actually identified these two groups of thoughts when it comes to working out. On one group, we have working out will be stress relief. I'll try new things during my workout. I'll have increased energy as soon as I'm done. I will look good in front of people while I am working out. In the other group, we have thoughts such as I will improve my mental and physical health. I will be more confident. I will lose weight. I will be healthier. I'll be more attractive. I'll reduce my risk for disease. The main difference between these two groups is timing. In the first, we have proximal positive outcomes, which means we expect the reward to happen while we are exercising or immediately after. And the second group, we have distal positive outcomes, which is we expect rewards to be farther in the future. Turns out, if you have more of the proximal thoughts, thinking about what kind of benefits you get right now, you are much more likely to report that you enjoy exercise and therefore to stick to it more. And if you are in the group who reports thinking about exercise with the distal positive outcomes, you're more likely to hate exercise and therefore quit and not do it. Now, I find this crazy because in the second group, that's what I tell patients, that's what we tell patients all the time. And this is how we try to motivate people to exercise and ourselves to exercise. And that's a bit backwards. The best thing you can do to change how much you enjoy exercise right now is to just turn your expectations into these proximal positive outcomes. Just borrow them from here or convert the ones that you already have into something that can happen right now or in the next few hours after. It is very likely to make a huge difference in how much you feel that you enjoy exercise. And if this sounds too good to be true, a glitch in a few behavioral studies, it's not just the data that shows this. The psychology supports this idea too. Self-determination theory defines feelings of enjoyment as a consequence of self-determined behavior. It's all in our head. Our brains have so much to do with how much we think that we enjoy things. Getting to do something that you want is the basis of enjoying it, and we can change our motivations by focusing on the closer things in order to enjoy it more. Just one tiny note here on still quitting exercise if you enjoy it, because a lot of studies do say that people who enjoy exercise tend to exercise more. That is likely true, because if you enjoy exercise, even though it doesn't seem to have a correlation with how likely you are to quit it, you are much more likely to restart exercise if you enjoy it. So that's what I think the data is showing in terms of enjoyment and quitting. I also think why this might be a big reason that having a training program by someone else is easier because it means I only ever focus on the right now goals and all the future things are covered by someone else. Whenever we have these discussions, it's someone else who kind of processes the thinking there and creates the plan for me. So I can just exist in the here and now, log in and be like, okay, this is what I'm doing, which I usually check on the way to the gym or at the gym, what I'm even doing on that day. That means I can really stay in the day-to-day, -day, the right now, the very temporary pleasure. And I think that has increased massively how much I enjoy exercise. Now, if you're thinking, well, wow, Elizabeth, lots of people have wanted to exercise to be healthier or to lose weight or to look better, and they've definitely managed it. So I don't know about this long-term goals not working, you're, you're absolutely right. It's just as always not that simple. If we combine the self-determination theory with the trans-theoretical model, we get the perfect combination of the exact timing and types of things that you can say to yourself to motivate yourself when is necessary along the steps of behavioral change. 
that's a mouthful. Looking back at these steps of behavioral change, and especially the first ones that I said I would go back to, when this theory was first discovered and lots of data was collected from people to validate it, what was found was unless you actively tried, there is no natural reason that you would progress through these steps. So you have to actively, logically push yourself through them. And this is where different sorts of motivation help at different times. In the 2000 paper, theories of exercise behavior, Biddle and Nig identified the first three steps, pre-contemplation, contemplation, and preparation as being experimental processes. While we're still preparing to take action, but we haven't yet taken action, we do benefit from things like self-revaluation and consciousness phrasing, basically the things that we said earlier. Thinking of things like being fitter, being healthier, living longer, are definitely things that can help us progress through these first experimental stages and are very useful here. However, as we gets onto the latter stages and we go into behavior and maintenance, these are now behavioral processes and no longer experimental. And here, if you are a beginner, like me, these sorts of long-term goals are no longer helpful and are actually detrimental to you enjoying the activity. Those of us who have been exercising for ages and are already highly motivated can use both a combination of short-term and long-term goals because they're already winning, literally anything helps them. In this graph, you can see as we approach the higher physical activity level and over a longer period of time, we can see that both the proximal and the distal positive outcomes will be very helpful in motivating our intrinsic behavior. However, when we are here at the lower levels of physical activity and are a beginner, we can see that thinking about the proximal goals is much more helpful than the distal goals. If you're pre-getting started or you have have quit for such a long time, it's fine. Go into like any sort of fitness inspo that you like, your favorite actor, your favorite actress, reading studies or papers or books on how helpful having a high muscle mass and high physical activity is for your life. But once you take the action and you're a beginner and you don't really enjoy it, cut all of that out and focus on the moment. Think about how you're going to sleep better that night because you're, you're tired. You can listen to your favorite audiobook or your favorite music while working out and ignore and shut out all of the rest. Lastly, a big reason that we quit completely projecting here is because our goals are completely out of whack, they do not make sense, and they almost guarantee that we will fail. There's this theory in economics called the theory of the second less, which was developed in 1956 by Lipsy and Lancaster. To state the theory, it refers to situations where one or more optimality conditions cannot be satisfied, stating that in this instant, it is possible that the next best solution involves changing other variables away from the values that would have otherwise been optimal. In actual English, we can say when we are setting goals with limited resources, the second best option may look nothing like the first. I've been unconsciously validating and a victim of this theory my whole life. For example, when I applied to university, my first option was to be a doctor, my second option was to be unemployed because I refused to even consider to do anything else. And therefore, the second best option looks very different to the first. And when I exercise, I expect that I should exercise six times a week, push myself the hardest every single time, end up looking like a Greek goddess. Otherwise, if I can't do this, my second best option is to stay in bed and do nothing. My brain can simply not comprehend that I would actively seek to do something which is not perfect and therefore I end up doing nothing in so many cases. I should be able to do the first if I consciously make a decision. How could, how could I make anything less than a perfect conscious decision? It is so annoying to live like this. This is, however, a fake problem that I've created myself. There is absolutely no reason that I cannot work out four times a week or do a bit shorter exercises or leave home sometimes even half of my exercise when I really, really don't feel like it or I have an emergency, that is absolutely fine. I don't have to always default to doing nothing. And as annoying and disgusting as this feels, it's actually been really helpful to do. I'm having to create reasonable second options for myself all over the place, mostly with exercise, and it's actually been life-changing. One way of approaching this perfectionism issue is to think of goals as being satisficing instead of perfect. So that's a combination of satisfactory and sufficient. So when you're planning for yourself, not going, what would I want? Because I have a very vivid imagination, if you're like me, I can draw upon anything that I've ever seen or imagined in my mind's eye for what I want myself to do, which realistically is not going to happen. So therefore thinking, actually, what would be a satisfactory and a sufficient thing to do, Elizabeth, for one of your patients? 
someone else would be very, very helpful. Or for yourself, if you can do that, and focusing on these answers instead of all those imagination. A story that I love, and I know it's really long, but I really love it and I want to share it with you, is this one music teacher who apparently was so frustrated with his music students for being too perfectionistic and not playing, I guess, with heart or like improvising when they're making music or playing music because they're sticking to the script every single time, that he created this sheet music that was intentionally made to be inhumanely possible. It would not be physically possible for you to move your fingers fast enough or hold your breath long enough to actually play the pieces the way that he wrote them. And he gave them to his students and they were forced to make shortcuts and make mistakes. And it was torture for them, but it was very, very helpful in the long term. So in those parts of your life where you, not Jim, Mm -mm. If you made it here, gym is not the kind of thing where you, I'd be experimenting like this right now. But the things in your life that you enjoy doing and you know you're not going to quit. Maybe don't finish a chapter in a book and skip to the next one. Maybe just do things that intentionally are less perfectionistic in order for you to break the cycle so then you can apply it to exercise too. I am so grateful to Cara because I have been in the trenches. Also, I haven't been making videos and struggling so much with coming back to making videos now. But I've been in the trenches having my final medical school exams in January and Cara sat me down and told me she's going to bring my exercises down to 30 minutes a day and my heart I sounded like I felt like I was being told off and I felt terrible. I was like, oh, no, I can't. But realistically, I wasn't going to gym. I was like this close to stopping to gym altogether because I didn't have the time. I didn't have the space. I was too stressed. And so doing that actually kept me in that mode where now I can slowly come to get out of it without having to quit, which was actually, in retrospect, mind blowing. So fix your theory of the second best using satisfying and this will fix things very, very well. If you're the type of nerd who made it here and you really like this, um, this kind of mathematical thinking. Um, a lot of this is by Byron Christian, who is one of my favorite authors. His book, Algorithms to Live By, you can get a free summary on it on short form because I think everyone gets free access to short form through my links. So I'm going to put a link of it in the description and you should definitely read it through. Um, his stuff is absolutely amazing. One thing that is glaringly obvious to me in this video I didn't put in and I'll probably make a whole second video on is the actual privilege of gymming in the first place and having enough time and money and space and energy. Having the privilege to even be rest enough and sleep enough to be able to think of these things or watch me ramble for so long is just something, I guess, for me to be aware of. My position, my advice when I'm in hospital in front of a patient is always so case dependent and I try to be as aware of this as possible. And I guess speaking these things on the internet is so different because I don't know who's watching. So I think that's just something I want to jump in to detail in another long video. So just want to end this on saying, don't, don't, don't be harsh. Hopefully something that I talked about today was helpful or new to you, even in things outside of exercise, if that's not on the cards right now. So yeah, definitely try the two weeks. It's free. It's fun. You'll definitely get things from it. And it's a really, really, really good experience. If you made it so far, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Be kind to yourself and others and do not believe everything you think. Thanks. Bye.